Robinson and I'm an aeromodeler and an engineer. Join me on a fascinating journey where I show you some of the techniques used in scale aeromodeling. Welcome back to the channel modelers. In this episode I'm going to just quickly cover some uh, footage that uh, got left off the last video um, and it, it's simply that I was planing the the leading edge of the wings to get them to, to shape and also you'll see I sanded them then there's the application of sanding sealer and a bit more sanding and in preparation for the tissue to go on I think I showed you putting the tissue on in the last video so I'll not go over that again but uh, we will be taking a look at the fuselage
Welcome back to the workshop modelers. Well, we're still working on this Dumas indoor RC scale thing. And uh, oh, we're, we're, we're cracking onwards. Um, I've completed covering the wing, which I've, I've not shown, but um, it's, it followed the same process that we, we did on the, uh, on the tail surfaces and the, and the upper section of the wing. Um, what I have done is, uh, and I'll show you in a moment, is the tissue I'm using is actually uh, not as porous as I usually use. This is the tissue that came with the VMC, uh, with the Dumas kit. Um, and it's, it's not such an open weave. Now this means that the, I can't apply it the way, you know, I usually do, soaking the dope through it. So what we're going to do, it, it, it's, um, it's a combination of what we've learned from the silver tissue that didn't really work and um, the way I normally do it. So what I'm actually going to do is stick this ticket tissue down onto the airframe, not through the tissue, but underneath, same as we did for the silver. But you, what you'll find is it actually works really well. And this tissue shrinks a whole heap more than the tea bag one. And also because it's the weave is filled in a lot more, it only takes a couple of coats of dope, of thin dope to, to seal it. So there are advantages. So the silver tissue exercise was actually quite worthwhile. So I'm going to show you now how I do it here. It's not as easy as the way I do it, to doping through it. It's not as easy, but it, it's still not particularly difficult. Now you can do it two ways, and I've tried both with the wing. One, putting it on wet and then lifting the edges and sticking it down, or I've tried putting it on dry. Both seem to work. However, I will say that if you put it on wet, it, it's much, much more taut when you're finished. So I'm going to continue to put it on wet, okay? Now the way I'm going to cover the fuselage is I'm going to, the, the chipmunk basically is, is two tubes joined together. And they're, they're joined together just behind the rear of the cockpit. Um, so you have a cone running to the, to the tail. Get this bit right. So as you can see, if you, if you wet it, it sort of semi sticks to the airframe. Now, the one area I am a little bit concerned about on this is these paper sections, because they may not like getting wet. So we'll just have to see how that goes. So the front section is, is, one, is one tube and it's constant radius, everything. And then the rear section is actually a cone. And again, the sides are flat and straight. So we should be able to cover it in two pieces. Just use some dope. Just stick the, the tissue down. If the tissue seems to start to dry out, just keep it wet with, with another spritz of the, of the water. You can see I'm just reaching through the gap between the tissue and the surface. And then pulling it kind of taut. That's one side done. I'll do the other side. And then you, I think you'll get the idea. And, uh,
So the saga continues. I've tissued the fuselage, as you can see. I've done it in patches, and I inadvertently used um, the, the really um, porous tissue in one place, which I didn't mean to do on this side. But you can see how much nicer it goes on. And then on this side, it's um, it's a bit raggedy. And I may have to redo a section through here because it's not looking very good. Anyway, that's beside the point. Um, so what I've done is, it, you may remember, um, I'm not sure whether I showed it, but I actually cut the entire nose off of the uh, fuselage once I'd made it. Not absolutely certain that was included in a video, but uh, I don't I don't show them all. Um, so I cut the entire nose off, and then I not only cut the nose off, but then I separated the nose section into two pieces. Now the idea is that I can get to the radio gear and to the motor and everything by taking this section off. And it's retained, as you will see, by magnets. There's three magnets there, and then there's, let's see if I get it in shot, there's one, two, and then one underneath, three magnets underneath. Now those magnets are easily strong enough. This is how I've done it for many years. Um, and you have to align them very carefully so that when you stick the nose on, it is retained in exactly the right position. Um, so the, the magnets must match. And as you can see, there's a bit of sellotape here. And I put the sellotape between the two magnets so that they can actually be attached to one side and then a smear of epoxy or super glue or something onto one half, push them all together and hold them. And then when it dries, you can get them apart, hopefully, and you can see how awkward that is to get apart. And then you can simply remove the tape He says, simply, a bit of paper come off there as well, never mind, get rid of that, a little bit of tape there. So now that clicks straight onto there and it's, it's held in position by the magnets. And um, you'll see the nose block is all shaped and I've made a quite a large hole in the, uh, in the nose block. And this is to accommodate the little APO5 brushless motor. And that will sit in there, like that. Now, I've got a lovely mount that would hold that, but I'm actually going to put just a dollop of pour, super pour, which is a sort of a contact adhesive, on each of those three lugs. That way, if I ever need to remove the motor, I can just push it from the other side and uh, we'll be able to remove the motor. Um, a mount would have been nice, but anything is, is extra weight, so um, so we'll leave it at that. But that'll, that'll position the motor, um, and I don't know whether I can hold it still when you see this end. And you can see how far out that's going to protrude through the shaft. And that should just be enough to get the the small motor collet on the end of the uh, the, the prop collet on the end of the, the motor shaft, and then the rubber bands hold the uh, hold the prop to it. Unless I find a better way of attaching the prop, but at the moment that's that's what we've got. So the top section, so th this will live probably like this most of the time, but if I do ever need to take it apart, I can. Um, Demagnetize, you know, just pull the front off. I'll tissue this next now that I'm happy with the position. Then this section will be held on with just two small magnets, even smaller than the ones I've just used, I think. Just two magnets. In fact, does it even need magnets? It's holding on on its own. Um, and this section is to allow me access. Yes, I'm not sure that's going to need batteries. Uh, uh, gonna, <laughs> gonna, <laughs> batteries. My head's going somewhere else. It's not going to need any magnets to hold that on, I don't think. So that allows me to then insert the, the battery pack into the model ready for flight. So And, and a little bit of maintenance on the uh, servo and that sort of stuff. But if I really need to get to the servos without all this lot in the way, then I can just de you know, decouple the, the front section. So there you go. That's where we are at the moment. Um, I shall carry on. Bit more of an update later. The way I'm going to hinge 
the control surfaces. So I've made a very tiny little slot with my scalpel and I'm going to use now some of you youngsters <laughs> won't know what it is but this is the inside of a diskette drive computer diskette drive and this is the um, the magnetic material on which the ones and zeros are recorded it's very useful as a hinging material so what I've done is I've just made a little slot in it just cut a bit I'm just going to cut it off here and it's just like plastic but uh, I find it it never really um, snaps unlike plastic so what I've done is I've just cut two short sections and all I'm going to do is thread one into one half of the surface like that with a little drop of CA on it another one in there then we simply slide rudder onto those hinges and we leave a bit of a gap to allow for the hinge to work. We use the same process to apply the uh, to do the hinges for the elevator. Cut a slot. Now I must confess I had considered because the elevators are so large on this model. I had actually considered fixing one elevator to the tailplane straight and then only actuate the other tailplane because the elevators are, uh, actuate the other elevator. The, um, the reason being that these elevators are quite large and uh, for an indoor model any elevator movement really can be quite dramatic um, and if they don't center perfectly then the model can be quite a handful so if you've only got one elevator to center it's um, possibly a little bit easier to trim than to fly. So I have actually decided that I would um, lock this elevator in place at the straighter head position or at level 
um, and then I'll, I will only actuate this elevator, this half. It'll give me a slight um, strange effect when I turn. Uh, if I use up elevator, it will pull that wing down a little bit and help it to turn right. Uh, and if I you know, use down elevator, it'll lift this side of the model a little bit. But I'm not overly worried about that. I think it'll be fine. So I'm just going to lock these hinges in place. Notice I put full deflection on before I um, put the glue in. That way we know we're going to get enough deflection. Now I would expect that this is only going to be moving probably four or five millimeters at the most and that's all it'll need. And I'll, I'll use quite a long horn at both ends to make sure that there's not too much deflection. So there you go. As you can see, the fuselage is more or less complete. I did give it a couple of coats of uh, banana oil. The, uh, the cowling section is also done. The little hatch for the top is uh, ready to go as well. So there we go. The servos are in. I've bound the receiver to the transmitter and centered all the servos in, the, in here. So all I've got to do now is run. I'm going to run pull-pull. Uh, very, very thin pull-pull cables to the rudder uh, and I'm going to use a push rod, carbon, probably a one millimeter, one and a half millimeter carbon push rod to actuate this one elevator half. This could be very difficult to see, but we'll, uh, we'll give it a shot. What we have here is a tiny little thread going round a carbon post. This is the thread in question. It's a, it's a nylon. It's a very fine nylon. Fishing line would work probably better, but it's very similar. This, the strain is not very high. So I've got one there. Turn it over. I see there's another one on that side. It's going through a little hole in the tissue. Okay. And at the front, You'll see the two lines come through forward. There's the screws missing from the servo, but it won't. Uh, I will. I will fit that shortly. But you see the two lines of thread are super glued straight onto the the servo arm. There's the throttle one in a more conventional method, uh, simply using a one millimeter carbon rod and a little bit of Z bend in, uh, in a piece of piano wire. If we look at the tail end, you'll see where the elevator is done. All I've used is a short length of carbon rod glued into a hole in the elevator and the one millimeter carbon rod is coming out of the rear fuselage through a slot. And then between the two, I've, I've coupled the two ends together with a piece of shrink tubing. It's only shrunk at the two ends, it's not shrunk in the middle. And as long as you allow a kink in the middle, it will operate fine. So let's see how this looks. And you can see it's centering really well. And that is one of the problems with indoor models with those linear servers, they don't center very well. And as you can see, I have only actuated one elevator half. This is to try and reduce the um, sensitivity of the model. It's a very big elevator. If we look at the, the rudder. You see it centers beautifully. One of the lightest ways to do it is push-pull like this. Um, and for indoor models where anything at the tail um, is, a, is a bit of a disaster. 
um, this is exactly what you need. So we've got elevator control and your control. No ailerons on this, just rudder. Okay. And there we go. So hope you enjoyed that. You can see we're making good progress. See you on the next video.